Hi folks, welcome to Gardening 101. Uh, today we're going to be talking about getting started in the garden. So uh, basically just a, an overview of some things, some ideas, uh, tips, and uh, kind of broad approaches and philosophies that will help you uh, get started down your path to organic gardening or permaculture. Um, I am the presenter. Uh, my name is Aaron Von Frank. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Grow Journey. Uh, my wife and I started the company. We are uh, an organic seeds of the month club, uh, certified organic by the USDA um, and Clemson University's Department of Plant Industry. I'm also an organic gardening teacher, uh, very much um, uh, passionate about this subject. Um, my wife and I live on a fully edible organic landscape in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so really looking forward to getting started. Um, again, this is going to be kind of a quick overview with just some things um, that will help you get started. And uh, we'll have other content uh, down the road that will be kind of more about um, in-depth uh, diving into particular subjects. So jumping right on in then, um, the first thing we're going to be talking about is uh, what is organic and permaculture gardening. So um, they're somewhat the same thing, but permaculture is more of a systems uh, oriented approach. It goes a little bit beyond just um, food production and um, you know just the garden. It's actually kind of almost like a lifestyle if you want to call it that. Uh, whereas organic is actually a, a very clearly defined um, set of criteria that's currently um, set up by both national and international uh, groups and organizations. Um, so they're somewhat the same things. So I'll use them interchangeably uh, throughout this presentation. Um, but basically, this is the kind of stuff that we want to teach you how to grow in these pictures. Um, so you can see some nice, beautiful um, produce pictures. This is uh, you know the kind of appetizing things that get people all excited about thinking about gardening. Um, and these are actually pictures from our garden. So um, all kinds of cool berries and fruits, and uh, we grow tons of stuff throughout the year. So we have, uh, I think we counted uh, 350 different varieties of edible plants, fruits, nuts, uh, berries, mushrooms, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so I want to just think of gardening as just, you know, an heirloom tomato. There's all kinds of things you can grow out there. Um, so let's get started. The first tip that we're going to offer, we're just going to go through kind of 10 tips here, um, is start now. And what we mean by that is basically, um, you know, so when we teach gardening classes, a lot of folks are saying, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to do this next year. I'm going to do this next spring. Um, and almost inevitably, if you check back with folks um, like that, you'll find that they actually didn't get started. Um, that's why we really think it's important um, when you're thinking about this in your mind or planning it out with your family, um, the question is going to come up, when, you know, when are we going to do this? Um, and we think the best answer and the correct answer that you need to go with is now, um, literally today, tomorrow, um, as quickly as you possibly can. Um, if it's nighttime right now, that's why maybe tomorrow would be the best answer. Um, but bottom line is, is start uh, quickly and start as quickly as you can to get out there, um, get some traction. It feels really good um, once you've kind of uh, accomplished something, done something to kind of get movement going um, and kind of getting getting going is really, really important. And along that note, uh, you know, let's say it's you happen to be listening to this and it's freezing outside um, or it's, too, you know, 100 degrees outside. So there's a lot of things you can be doing to get started. We don't necessarily mean putting your hands in the soil here. Um, we mean, you know, planning it out, putting a design together, uh, going out maybe if you have to buy some pots, if you're on a patio garden, whatever that happens to be. But basically uh, making progress. Um, and that becomes sort of addictive and you want it to kind of do more and more and more as you get going. So tip one, start now. And tip two uh, is sort of related to that, and that's start small. Um, so another thing, uh, this is something we've learned personally, um, both in uh, business and also uh, in our garden, is that if you take on too much at once, um, you're going to get overwhelmed, you're going to get frustrated, you're not going to accomplish the things you want to accomplish, um, and then you're going to end up stopping. Um, so that's not really what you want to do. You want to basically, uh, we call it in, in the world of, of software, if there's any software or computer folks out there, uh, it's called agile development. So you do this, the smallest thing you can as quickly as possible, get it accomplished, move on to the next thing. And again, that kind of builds. So that, that builds momentum. Uh, you're feeling good about things. And, you know, worst case scenario is uh, you start, let's say you start super small. Um, you have one patio plant. Uh, in a pot on your back deck and it happens to die, not a big deal. Um, you've learned something from that. You can still move from, move forward from it uh, and keep going. Um, so starting fast, starting small, very, very important. Um, we really want to see people getting out there, getting their hands dirty, um, learning uh, through experiencing things. That's really the best teacher out there that you're ever going to have. Um, 
you know, probably even more important than uh, what you're going to learn in a book or uh, in other areas. So really important, get started and start small. Tip three is be social. Uh, this has been also really important to us uh, as we started off years ago. Um, and this can be online and offline just because you might live on a homestead or you might live out in the middle of nowhere. It uh, doesn't mean you can't be social and learn from other people. So there's really uh, phenomenal groups out there online. Um, there's permaculture groups um, that you can find, again, potentially even in your own community with, with people that you can meet up with. Uh, they have things called permablitas where uh, they'll get together and everybody will kind of contribute to um, projects on someone's farm or projects at someone's house uh, where you can really learn hands-on from some really experienced and knowledgeable people. Um, and even again, if you're not uh, with them in your community, you can still uh, you know, ask questions on these online groups. Uh, we're part of various permaculture groups on Facebook and whatnot. Uh, and we've learned a lot from those folks. Um, organic gardening clubs, uh, these might be in your area also or again online. Uh, community gardens. So uh, let's say you're in a you know well-developed neighborhood. Um, there might be a pretty good chance there's a community garden or a church garden, whatever it happens to be, that you can participate in um, to learn from other people's experience and potentially on other people's land, um, which is nice too before you uh, have to worry about doing it at your own house or homestead or farm, whatever it happens to be. Um, another one that's really important uh, especially has been for us, is uh, getting your family and friends involved without being pushy. Uh, so, um, you know, you know, every time they see you, you don't want to say, hey, you know, come out into my garden with me. Uh, so you don't have to push them out there, but just, um, you know, invite them. Um, one of the best ways to do that is by uh, offering some nice produce, and that kind of tends to per uh, pique people's interest when they see some of the stuff that you're growing and they get a chance to eat that. So it's a really fun uh, family activity. You're going to learn a lot. Yeah, there's some hard work involved sometimes, um, but, you know, the best things in life really uh, require a little bit of work and some knowledge. Tip four, uh, sun, soil, and water. So every plant requires these elements, um, a certain amount of sun, uh, certain types of soil or soil conditions, uh, and certain moisture levels or rainfall requirements. So uh, really one of the important things here is just because you might, let's say you live in the middle of a forest and it's full shade, or you live in a you know, boggy, wet area, whatever it happens to be, um, I absolutely guarantee you there are edible plants that will grow wherever you live, whatever the conditions are going to be, um, that will grow there and will produce a wonderful yield. So th just because you have uh, certain conditions doesn't mean that you have an excuse for not being able to put a good edible plant into that spot. Um, we grow edible plants in our pond in the backyard. Uh, we grow edible plants in our fully shaded uh, forest underneath the canopy. Um, and we grow edible plants in full full sun, you know, perfectly normal garden spots that you would be um, used to seeing. So, um, it but also is important to choose the right plants for the right spots. So, for instance, you know, we wouldn't grow a big beefsteak heirloom tomato out in our forest because it wouldn't get enough sun. Um, so, you know, again, knowing a little bit about the plants and um, the system that you're putting those plants into, the system being the location, is really going to be important. Um, and you'll learn this stuff over time also, and, you know, if you buy seeds, then you'll see on the seed packet, you know, it requires full sun or part shade or whatever it happens to be. So you're not going to want to go and uh, put those plants in the wrong spot. Tip five uh, has to do with year-round gardening. So where we live, uh, we're in Greenville, South Carolina, or just outside the city. Uh, we're in agricultural zone 7B in the U.S., and uh, we can grow food 365 days per year here. Um, so we've had a couple of really uh, uh, tough cold snaps the last few few winters where it got down to five degrees. And if you're living in Canada, you're probably laughing because that's, you know, that's like summer for you guys. Uh, but for us, that's pretty darn cold, five degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we were out at, at those mornings, those days, um, we uncovered our hoop house. Or we have little polytunnels that we grow food under uh, during the winter, um, harvesting plants. Um, I think we got cilantro and spinach and kohlrabis and things of that nature and kales. So there's a lot of really cold hardy plants um, that you can grow no matter where you are. And uh, the image here on the left shows just you know, your freeze dates and this, this has to do with your agricultural zones. Um, so it's important to know where you live, uh, what can grow there, and choosing the plants that are appropriate. And believe it or not, there's people in Canada and Maine and Minnesota that we've talked to that are actually growing plants year-round in the harshest conditions you could imagine as far as cold. Um, so, you know, it might require a little extra hardware, a little extra effort um, relative to someone, let's say, in uh, South Carolina or Florida, you know, the areas of the country that are warmer 
um, but you can still do it, um, and it's important to know that. So you can garden uh, any time of the year. Um, and one of the things, too, is uh, people tend to actually like um, the fall or the early spring or the winter gardening a little better because a lot of the pest insects and things that people don't tend to like or maybe even plant diseases uh, aren't really out. They they tend to go dormant during those cooler months. And so you can you know not really have to do much other than go out there and maybe a water occasionally. Um, and harvesting is really your main thing. So that's a picture of my wife with a big basket of uh, looks like fall produce there, some bok choy and lettuces and things of that nature in the picture. So gardening year-round. You can get yields from your garden any day of the year. Tip six um, is basically there's a lot of confusion out there um, around seeds. So our seed company is Grow Journey. Uh, again, we're a Seeds of the Month Club, so we're a subscription service. And uh, heirloom seeds, hybrid seeds, OP, which means open pollinated, what does this stuff mean? Um, so heirlooms are basically, uh, tend to be older varieties. They're all open pollinated. And what that means is that you can take the seeds, uh, plant them, and if you have a certain isolation distance from other plants that could cross-pollinate them, um, you can actually save the seeds from year to year and they'll be genetically true to the parent. So you'll grow the same thing. Um, just as an example, one of our absolute favorite heirlooms uh, that we provide to our members, um, garden berries, it's Aunt Molly's ground cherry there. Uh, kind of a really cool fruit, tastes like a cross between uh, almost like a pineapple and a really sweet tomato. It's absolutely delicious. Um, it's native to uh, to the Americas. And um, this is an heirloom seed. It's, uh, you know, who knows how old it is. Native Americans are eating it. Um, a really wonderful open pollinated heirloom variety. A hybrid seeds, um, you know, a lot of these things are, are, are perfectly fine to grow too, but you can't save your seeds from hybrids or you don't know what you're going to get. Um, so you might get something that's sort of true to the parent. You might get something that's completely wacky and, and different. So who knows? Um, so we really love heirloom seeds. We love open pollinated seeds, um, and we encourage gardeners to grow those as well because you can save the seeds, and you can also potentially do some breeding of your own. Um, and you get really neat things, uh, especially with a lot of the heirloom varieties. So you might say, you know, I don't like beans, um, but I almost guarantee you there's a bean out there. Um, as you can see here, there's so many different uh, colors and textures and varieties um, in the heirloom world of things you can try and experience. So you're probably going to find something that you do like. Um, even if you, did, you just didn't really like the sterile, bland varieties, you might get at a grocery store. So, again, we prefer, um, personally, heirloom open pollinated varieties. Uh, nothing wrong with hybrids. Um, and also, just to you know uh, that you can't currently get uh, GMO, uh, GE, whatever you want to call them, genetically modified organisms or genetically engineered seeds in the home gardening sector. Um, so even though you see a lot of companies saying, you know, we're non-GMO uh, gardening seeds, that that's great, that's fine. Um, but... In reality, you actually can't even get those uh, for your home garden at this point. Those are just basically uh, seeds um, that cost you know tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to produce, and they're basically uh, produced for farmers that are buying you know thousands and thousands of dollars worth of seeds every year. Um, so you don't have to worry about you know are these seeds are my garden seeds GMO because um, you currently, as of 2016, um, cannot buy uh, GMO garden seeds. Tip seven is adding perennial plants. So uh, perennials are, um, just to kind of give you a quick definition, annuals are things like your tomatoes, your peppers, uh, things that basically are going to live uh, for one year or less. They're basically, you know, typically just a single growing season. Um, biennials are sort of in between. Um, if you're, those are things like your brassicas, uh, your broccolis, your uh, kohlrabis and kales and things of that nature that um, you know, most people harvest in the first year, but if you want to grow seed, you're going to actually have to overwinter them, uh, and they'll produce seed during their second year. And then perennials are um, the things that will live potentially uh, longer than you will. Um, so just in the pictures here, we have pictures of our grapes and some of our raspberries, things that we grow, um, nuts, uh, fruits, berries, things of that nature. Um, wonderful to add to your system. What's cool about perennials is they you know get bigger and produce more and more yields each year. So um, that's that's pretty awesome. You kind of get a return on your investment. Yes, they take longer to produce. You might not get food your first year like you will with a tomato plant. Um, but over time, um, you're going to get more uh, while doing less work from your perennials. So they're really kind of the workhorse of your environment, and they really help establish some good beneficial insects and good microorganisms in your soil, you know, fungi and things like that to help your annual plants as well. Uh, so be sure to add perennials into your system. Tip number eight is we're big advocates of no-till um, soil building or no-till organic gardening. And um, 
believe it or not, uh, so we showed you some of the pictures of some of the produce we've grown. Um, we have not tilled our soil in seven years, I think, at this point. Um, so you don't have to till. It's just a lot of work. Um, it's unnecessary. It actually damages your soil structure, uh, damages the microorganisms in your soil that make your soil work. Um, so that might be kind of a surprise if you're a new gardener. You kind of have this image of, I'm going to have to go out there and till my soil every year. Um, when we see bare uh, exposed soil that's been tilled, we kind of cringe because we know um, that's sort of like a hurricane or an earthquake or something hitting a human community. Um, yes, it can rebuild. Those communities can rebuild. Um, but every single year, if you're doing that to your soil, um, that's just going to require you to do a lot of work um, and add a lot of additional inputs, you know, fertilizers and things like that into your soil um, that you wouldn't otherwise have to do if you learn no-till methods. Um, so things that we do to really help our soil and building our soil in the short and long run um, are top dressing with mulch. And when we say top dressing, what we mean by that is basically, uh, you know, and also let me say what mulch means. Uh, mulch is basically wood chips, chopped leaves, straw, pine straw, uh, basically uh, formerly living plant matter that you're putting on the surface of your soil. You're not tilling it in, you're not plowing it in. Um, that's going to actually, if you plow that stuff into your soil, it's going to rob the nitrogen or fix the nitrogen temporarily. Um, and you don't want to do that, so you just want to put it on top of your soil. We like to use wood chips because it doesn't blow away. And it, it's a nice slow release uh, breakdown of uh, decomposition. And that's essentially feeding your soil. It's covering it, so it's uh, not going to get irradiated by the sun. Um, it's going to really help you uh, with soil or with water absorption when it rains. It's going to also help you keep that water in your soil, so it's not evaporating as quickly as it would as if you had tilled uh, bare soil. Um, so it's really, really good for your soil to top dress and keep it covered at all times, either with mulch or with living plants. Uh, it's really important. So if you're a big farmer or even a small farmer and you're listening to this, there's a some really cool research coming out of a place called Rodell Institute. It's one of the uh, oldest, um, uh, kind of the guys that started the organic movement in the United States. Uh, and they've been doing side-by-side -side comparisons of organic versus conventional food production for over 30 years in their trial systems in Pennsylvania. And uh, the way they do uh, no-till and, and uh, mulching on large-scale farms that they're, that they're operating is by they grow their own mulch and they basically just drop it. They have a special crimper, covers the soil, uh, blocks out weeds, um, and and basically slowly uh, feeds and, and protects the soil. So really cool stuff there. Um, composting number two. Uh, so we recommend the Berkeley Hot Composting Method. Uh, it was a method developed out of Berkeley University in the, a few decades ago. And uh, the magic of, of hot composting versus comp cold composting, and cold composting is essentially uh, where you just have a big pile and you sort of let it rot on its own. Um, hot composting is a little more involved and it's a little more work, but you can get, um, and I'm saying this correctly, you can get soil or good compost in as little as 17 uh, to 21 days. And that, let me repeat that, 17 to 21 days from starting material to finished compost, which is amazing. Um, and some of the cool things that happens during that process is you're going to heat your pile up uh, over 140 degrees, and that's sort of this magical temperature um, where once you heat it up over 140, um, what happens is you burn out your pathogens, your pathogenic organisms that can you know, potentially harm your plants and your disease-causing organisms. So all you're left with is your beneficial organisms, microorganisms, uh, good bacteria, good fungi, good protozoa, nematodes, all the good stuff that you want to have in your soil to protect and to feed your plants. Um, and the other thing it does is it burns out your weed seeds. So if you put a bunch of weedy material in there that has a bunch of seeds, if you're cold composting it, and then you put that cold compost onto your garden beds, you would end up with a lot of a lot of weeds in your in your garden. So you don't want that. Uh, whereas if you're hot composting, you have literally no weed seeds at the end of the process. So you can look look up the Berkeley hot composting method. There's a lot of good information online about how to do that. Um, again, it requires a little bit of work, but it's so much better, and it's definitely worth it. Um, and then what you can do with that compost once you have it is you can either uh, top it, put it on top of your beds about two inches deep and let it kind of you know, water in on its own. Um, or you can also, uh, one of the ways we like to like kind of stretch our compost is by uh, turning it into an actively aerated compost tea. So we have a bubbler and a whole thing we go through, add a little bit of molasses, um, and end up in about 24 hours with some really potent, uh, and I mean potent, I mean powerful, uh, compost tea that we then put on as a soil drench on our beds. Uh, or even use it as a foliar spray, especially um, if you're doing a lot of orchards and uh, perennial plants, you know, things that might be more susceptible to disease like apples and pears and peaches and things of that nature. 
um, using your uh, compost tea as a foliar spray in the spring and the different points throughout the year really helps those plants. Um, we get some kind of a nice, essentially a pr protective shield of biology um, on all their surfaces and on the flower surfaces that helps prevent disease and make them healthier. Um, so really cool stuff there. Uh, third one, um, which we've also used, this is more of a small scale thing, you probably wouldn't be able to do this on a big farm, uh, is hugel culture. And that's an old uh, Germanic uh, uh, practice um, that basically has to do with um, you bury a ton of, uh, or not literally a ton, but you bury quite a bit of uh, rotting wood, um, compost, things of that nature, and then you pile your soil on top of that. And what if you do this right, you can literally have uh, you know, 30, 40 years of soil that requires you know no work. Once you put your plants in that stuff, it acts as a big nutrient-rich sponge. Um, so your once your plant roots get in there, um, they require no water, they require no fertilizer. Um, really amazing stuff. We've we've done this with some of our peach trees and fruit trees, and we've had people come over to our house and look at our trees and say, "Man, those things must be 20 years old." And we're like, "No, no, the trees are only about five years old." So just really boost uh, the fertility and uh, reduces stress on your plants when you plant them in hugel culture beds. Uh, Again, a wonderful technique. So these are three ways that we uh, recommend going about no-till soil building in your own garden or farm or homestead. Tip number nine is fertilizers and pesticides. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so if we told you that we use no fertilizer um, and that we use no pesticide, but we're growing all this food, uh, you probably kind of think we're crazy because that's not really what you tend to think. So um, we don't buy any synthetic fertilizers. Uh, we don't use any synthetic pesticides. Um, all we're doing is essentially uh, mirroring nature, mirroring, you know, we look at a forest system that doesn't require water, doesn't require fertilizer, doesn't require pesticide, and doesn't really require a human being to have anything to do with it, um, but it grows stronger and more resilient and more abundant each year. Um, so wouldn't it be cool if you could do that in your own garden? And the cool thing is you can. Um, so that's what we, we like to teach people to do. Gardening doesn't have to be drudgery, doesn't have to be really hard work, doesn't have to be all the things that you might uh, think it think it might have to be. So um, we want you to be kind of a lazy gardener, but that requires you to be a smart and knowledgeable gardener instead. Um, so with pests, uh, what we, and we should put quotations here, uh, air quotations around the word pests, uh, if you think about it, pest insects are necessary in order to have predatory insects. If you went out and let's say you went over to Africa and did the Serengeti and you took away all the antelopes, um, what would the lions eat? What would the cheetahs eat? What would the leopards eat? Uh, they wouldn't have any food. So the same thing is really true with your pest insects. Um, so in the image here, uh, that scary looking orange and black bug, um, what that is is a ladybug larva. And the little dots there that it's eating, those are called aphids. And they are a very common and often very hated pest insect. Um, we kind of think of them as candy for our predator predatory insects. So um, this is these are on a uh, Rosa rugosa, rugosa, which is an edible uh, rose. Produces really lovely flowers that are great for teas and candies, and also produces a really wonderful rose hip that tastes sort of like a peach. Um, so these things are actually uh, these aphids were on our our plant. We see this happen all the time. Um, we see a bunch of aphids. We'll go out and say, "Huh, this is kind of neat. Let's go back in a couple of days and see what happens." And al almost inevitably, uh, some predatory insect has come in there and is either eating or has already finished eating all the pests off that plant. Um, whether that's, you know, uh, in this case, the ladybug larva, uh, lacewing larva, there's all kinds of neat plant or neat insects out there that will come in and essentially be your pest control for you. So for us, a guiding principle is really, really important. And that is basically, if you cannot identify the insect or its role in your ecosystem, do it no harm. Um, there's plenty of times when we were starting off as gardeners, actually, one of the most painful things was before we knew what ladybug larvae looked like, we saw them, we're like, man, what are, what are these things? Um, and they're, you know, they're going to eat or kill our plants. And so we started smushing them. And we went back inside, looked them up, and we're like, oh, man, we just killed, you know, 20 uh, of, our, of our ladybugs, you know. So really important lesson that we learned there, um, kind of painful. Um, but same thing applies to a lot of other insects. We see so many insects that look scary and whatnot. You go out there and you look them up and you find out they're really good things that you want to have around your garden. They're hunters or they're pollinators or whatever it happens to be. So um, be really light in your touching of, of your insects. And if you don't know what they are, um, as a general rule, don't kill them. Uh, so with fertilizers, again, already already touched on how, how you go about, um, instead of using fertilizers, building natural soil fertility. 
and that creates much, much healthier plants, um, plants that don't have the stress in the, in the uh, stress plants. Basically, what happens there is then they become uh, much more susceptible to disease. If they have nutrient deficiencies, they're going to have um, insects and, and diseases that are really going to come after them. Um, so again, by building natural fertility, natural soil fertility or biological soil fertility, you're going to really reduce uh, your needs um, for both pesticides and you should never have to use uh, synthetic fertilizers or any kind of even uh, mineral fertilizers for that matter. So feed your soil what it knows how to eat, which is basically uh, composts, um, you know, maybe some manures, um, the, the various mulches that we talked about, culture. And by feeding your soil the things it knows how to eat, and you're going to really encourage the beneficial microorganisms in that soil, and those things are going to really help your plants. So that's what you want to have, and that, that ultimately produces healthier, um, more nutritious food for you as well. So tip 10, uh, learn, grow, repeat. So this is a nice little cyclical pattern here. So um, learning, basically what you're doing right now, really, really important. Um, but if you don't couple that with growing, um, you're just going to be kind of stuck there. So you got to learn, you got to grow, get out there, get your hands dirty, get in the garden, uh, get some good veggies and fruits growing um, and on your, in your dinner, dinner table, and then repeat. Uh, and you're just going to go throughout that cycle. Really, it's a lifelong cycle. Uh, you're going to learn more every single year, and you're going to grow more and more food every single year. So after five years, you're going to be an expert, um, and that's a wonderful feeling because it's empowering. And that's not something anyone can ever take away from you. And you're going to carry that with you for the rest of your life. You're going to get better and better at it, something you can teach your kids, teach your grandkids. Um, and that is a really powerful tool to have uh, in the face of, you know, who knows what uh, could come down the road. But just being able to grow your own food uh, and grow your own organic food with minimal inputs uh, required is a wonderful um, thing to know. Um, it's better for your health, um, better for your wealth, and just better for your overall happiness and well-being. So something we really, really um, want you to do. And that is the end of our 10 tips. I hope you enjoyed this how to get started tutorial. And uh, we'll refer to rule number one here now that we're at the end, which is basically get started today. Uh, so if it's winter, your ground's frozen solid. That might mean uh, putting together your plans, maybe trying to figure out where you're going to source your materials, whether you're buying them, whether you're uh, you know, scrapping it together. Um, but get started. That's the main thing. We want you to see uh, progress and feel uh, the momentum that comes with action. Um, this is our duck, our, one of our ducks, um, Welsh Harlequin is the breed um, in our garden, and she is encouraging you to try our company, which is growjourney.com, uh, free for 30 days. So you just go to growjourney.com uh, and give us a free try. Uh, see what you think. We are, again, our USDA certified organic seeds of the month club, um, but we don't just provide seeds. We also provide an educational service that teaches you how to garden um, and do these things using organic and permaculture principles. So uh, just a quick thing, I you know, have to have to pitch our company here at the end. 87% um, of our members um, say they are better and more knowledgeable gardeners, organic gardeners, as a result of uh, our services. And uh, that, what's interesting is we have a range of folks, uh, green thumbs and brown thumbs, people who've been gardening um, for over five years. Actually, a pretty good chunk of our members have, and they're still uh, learning a lot from what we have to offer. Um, so that's a, that's a neat thing for us. Um, also, uh, our members gave our educational services a 9 out of 10 star rating. So um, we're just going to get better with time. Um, again, uh, we encourage you to go over, give us a try for free. Um, thanks a lot for listening, um, and we will talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.